Good afternoon. The legislative hearing of the Subcommittee on Health of the Veterans Affairs Committee will now come to order. First, I want to welcome all the members of the subcommittee, both new and those returning. I'm extremely excited to be able to work with each and every one of you this Congress. I ask unanimous consent that our fellow committee member, Representative Mervan, be allowed to sit in at the dais to participate in today's proceedings. Hearing no objection, so ordered. Before we get started, I would like to take a moment to introduce myself. My name is Marionette Miller Meeks, and I proudly serve the people of Iowa's first congressional district. Most importantly, as a member of this committee, I serve all of those veterans who rely on the VA for their care and benefits. I'm also a 24-year Army veteran and an ophthalmologist, and I'm married to a 30-year Army veteran. Six of the eight children in my family served in the military, as well as my father, uncles, and grandfather. I also formerly served as the director of Iowa's Department of Public Health. As a veteran myself, and one who has worked as a, both a nurse and a physician at the VA hospital, I have seen firsthand both the strengths and weaknesses of our VA hospitals and clinics. Veterans deserve the care of utmost quality, and I work, will work tirelessly to ensure that they get the care that they have earned. We have a responsibility also in Congress to hold the VA accountable. I'm honored to serve as the chairwoman of this subcommittee. The House Committee on Veterans Affairs has a reputation for operating in a bipartisan manner. I look forward to continue working closely with Ranking Member Brownlee and all of our members on both sides of the aisle. Turning to today's hearing, we are here to discuss nine bills that would address a number of issues impacting America's veterans and the health care services they receive from the VA. I'd first like to express my frustration that we did not receive VA testimony until late yesterday. We requested that the testimonies be sent to us 48 hours in advance, and that simply was not the case. The list of bills we are discussing today were first sent to the VA on February 28th. That gave the VA ample time to review, and, makes, and it makes our jobs that much more difficult. I look forward to the VA submitting their testimony on time at the next hearing. I want to reiterate that one of my top priorities that I know is shared by many, if not all, of my colleagues is to ensure timely and quality care to veterans. As a member of a rural district, I know the challenges that come with meeting that goal. The nine bills before us today address scheduling appointments in a timely manner, ensuring veterans have available patient advocates, ensuring veterans access to home-based long-term care, and creating a stable leadership environment within the Veterans Health Administration. I cannot ignore the significance of the Toxic Exposure Fund, also called TEF, and how it impacts the legislation we are discussing today. Health programs are now subject to mandatory funding and scoring based on a percentage of the overall estimated cost. The work of this subcommittee will soon come to a halt if we do not work together to address this funding issue. I look forward to our discussion on the merits and challenges of all the legislation before us today, and I'm looking forward to the input from the VA and from other stakeholders. And thank you all for being here. I now yield to Ranking Member Brownlee for her opening remarks. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman Miller Meeks, and I'm looking forward to working closely with you. It is a pleasure to be here as our subcommittee begins its important work for the 118th Congress. It has been my uh, greatest honor to serve on the Health Subcommittee for more than 10 years now. Uh, since my very first term in Congress, this will be my sixth term serving as either the ranking member or chair of the subcommittee. We've been through a lot and accomplished a great deal during the time uh, all of us have served. In just the last few years, we passed the Deborah Sampson Act and the PACT Act, two comprehensive laws that will greatly improve access to VA health care services for women veterans and veterans with toxic exposure. Together with VA, we faced a once in a century global pandemic, a crisis that the VA healthcare system managed very, very well. However, there is one key area where I wish I could say that more progress has been made, and that is the extent to which VA is enabling veterans to age at home and avoid spending the last years of their lives in nursing homes or other institutional care settings. I doubt there is a person here today who has not grappled with the decision of how best to care for an aging or disabled loved one. 
Roughly 90% of aging adults would prefer to remain at home versus being admitted to a long-term care facility if they can absolutely avoid it. Veterans are no different. Over the last couple of decades, we have seen, uh, we have seen states place greater emphasis on investment in home and community-based services, helping Medicaid beneficiaries prevent or delay admission to nursing homes. Studies have shown that these rebalancing efforts have saved money, provide better health outcomes, and allowed Medicaid programs to serve more beneficiaries. As of fiscal year 2019, Medicaid expenditures for home and community-based services accounted for about 59% of the state's total long-term care spending. However, as of fiscal year 2022, VA's investments were nearly the opposite of that, with VA allocating about 65% of its overall geriatrics and extended care budget to institutionalized care, a category of spending that now accounts for about 10% of uh, VHA's total annual budget. This is not sustainable. Aside from the budgetary implications, there simply are not enough beds or staff in institutional care settings inside the VA or in the community to meet the expected need, particularly as Vietnam War era veterans enter their later years. More importantly, this is not what veterans, their caregivers, or their families want. That's why I'm pleased the subcommittee is considering the, my, my bill, the Elizabeth Dole Home Care Act, as part of today's agenda. Among other things, it will require VA to offer the Veteran Directed Care Program, the Homemaker and Home Health Aid Program, the Home-Based Primary Care Program, and the Purchase Skilled Home Care Program at all VA medical centers within two years of enactment. Currently, there are only, they, they are only available at medical centers that have chosen to implement them. These programs help veterans with activities of daily living, allowing them to receive primary care at home and provide skilled nursing care for veterans with higher levels of need. Our bill will also expand access to respite care, uh, respite care for caregivers of veterans in these programs. Under this legislation, VA will be required to improve coordination between the program of comprehensive assistance for family caregivers and VA's other home-based care programs. If a veteran does not meet the enrollment criteria for the caregiver support program, the VA will proactively assess the veteran and their caregiver for enrollment in other home-based programs. General Bergman and I first introduced the Elizabeth Dole Home Care Act just over a year ago in February of 2022. Very quickly, this bill achieved the rare feat of bipartisan bicameral support with Senators Moran and Tester introducing a Senate companion a few weeks later. Unfortunately, we were unable to enact this bill before the end of last year, but I'm very hopeful that we will get it across the finish line during this Congress. To do that, however, we will have to overcome a major hurdle, which is the Congressional Budget Office's score for the bill, which, to be quite frank, does not make a whole lot of sense to any of us. Uh, in late November 2022, C CBO issued a cost estimate that far exceeded our expectations. We were given a preliminary estimate in the hundreds of millions, but were shocked when the final estimate came back at $24.6 billion over a 10-year period. We are engaged in ongoing discussions with CBO about how they arrived at that estimate, and we are actively working to help them refine it. Today's hearing will help inform these efforts, so I thank our witnesses for being here and for offering their expertise. I also look forward to discussing many of the other bills on today's agenda and to continuing the important work of the Health Subcommittee during the 118th Congress. And with that, I yield back to Chairwoman Miller Meeks. Thank you, Rank Ranking Member Brownlee. We're having a video issue for live stream, but we're going to go ahead and continue uh, the meeting uh, with respect for everyone's time. Uh, we have a very full agenda today, so I'll be holding everyone to three minutes per bill so that we can get through it all. I'm honored uh, to be joined this uh, afternoon by several of my colleagues who are going to be testifying about the bills on our agenda. 
I appreciate the steadfast dedication that each of you have made to help our veterans. With this committee this afternoon are Representative Brian Mast from Florida, Representative uh, James uh, Barrett, a fellow veteran from Indiana, Representative John Molinar from Michigan, Representative Steve Womack, another fellow veteran from Arkansas, and Representative Debbie Lesko from Arizona. But first, I would like to recognize Ranking Member Takano for three minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairwoman Miller Meeks, for the courtesy. Um, uh, and I thank you for inviting me to today's hearing. I'm proud to be here to discuss my bill, the Korean American Valor Act, HR 366. This legislation will provide eligibility for VA health care to veterans who served in the armed forces of the Republic of Korea as allies of the United States during the Vietnam War who have since become naturalized U.S. citizens. This will be done through a reciprocal agreement. Korea would reimburse the United States for the health care services VA furnishes to these Korean American veterans. In exchange, the United States will reimburse Korea for health care it provides to veterans of the U.S. Armed Forces residing in Korea. My bill would provide some measure of long overdue parity for Korean American Vietnam War veterans who up to this point have never been eligible for VA health care services. This stands in stark contrast to veterans from European countries that were United States allies during World War II and World, uh, during World War I and World War II who have had access to VA health care for decades. Since 1958, through its Allied Beneficiary Program, VA has had the authority to treat veterans who have served in the armed forces of nations that were allied with the United States during World War II and World War, World War I and World War II. These veterans do not need to be U.S. citizens, and VA has the authority to treat veterans of any combat era. In 2022, VA provided care to 1,360 Allied beneficiaries, 1,153 1 of whom were under the age of 65. VA furnishes this care through reciprocal agreements which have been established with the United Kingdom, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and South Africa. In 1976, VA's Allied Beneficiary Program was extended to certain veterans who had served in the armed forces of Czechoslovakia or Poland during World War II uh, or World War I, and who subsequently became U.S. citizens. Because this authority was established when these two nations were still under communist rule, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, and Poland do not have reciprocal agreements with the United States. Today is National Vietnam War Veterans Day, and it is the 50th anniversary of the date of the last combat troops left Vietnam. Let, let this serve as a call to action. It is far past time for our nation to properly honor the service of these Korean American veterans who served side by side with American troops. It is the United States' obligation as a longtime ally of the Republic of Korea and as a beneficiary of these veterans' sacrifices during the Vietnam War to ensure they finally receive the same respect and consideration that their European counterparts have received for generations. The needs of Korean American um, veterans uh, and uh, of the Vietnam War are no different from those of U.S.-born veterans, from Agent Orange exposure to coping with complex injuries and mental illnesses. These veterans deserve the specialized care and services that VA can provide. Am I going over time? Uh, and I'll stop there. I think you got the point. So thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Representative Mead. We're then you're now back to the three minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman uh, Miller Meeks, I, uh, for inviting me today. I greatly appreciate being at the hearing. Uh, I am pleased to be here to discuss my recently introduced bill, the VHA Leadership Transformation Act, H.R. 1256. My bill will extend the term of appointments to the VA's Undersecretary of Health, or USH, for five years. It also removes existing statutory restrictions on the number of assistant undersecretaries for health that VHA can have, and it eliminates the requirement that all but two of them be physicians or dentists. <clears throat> The intent of my bill is to provide greater leadership stability at VHA by shielding the agency from leadership turnover with every change in presidential administrations. It will also help address governance challenges that have impeded oversight and accountability and empower VHA to more effectively address veterans' health care needs. Now I know what you may be wondering. Why should VA make these changes and wouldn't this cause VHA to operate differently from other federal agencies. As to why now, we only need to look back at the last six years or so. With the confirmation of Dr. 
Alenin Hall in July 2022, VHA got its first Senate confirmed Undersecretary for Health since January of 2017. Between January 2017 and July 2022, six different individuals rotated through this office, either acting as or performing the delegable duties of the Undersecretary of Health. Longtime observers of the VA healthcare will recall that the incredible transformation that occurred between 1994 and 1999 under the leadership of Dr. Kenneth Kaiser. He was a visionary who led the VHA away from being a system heavily focused on delivering inpatient care in old, often underutilized hospitals to one that is now largely focused on delivering primary care and preventative care through the vast network of outpatient clinics. The VA that so many veterans and employees now and love today simply would not be what it is were it not for the steady leadership of Dr. Kaiser. All I'll also add that there are a number of other positions across the federal government with five-year terms, including the Social Security Administrator, the Federal, Administration, federal Aviation Administrator, and the IRS Commissioner. The Director of the FBI Services serves for 10-year terms. If any incoming president wants to replace any of these off officials prior to the expiration of their term, the president has the authority to do that and in my bill would allow the same for VA's Undersecretary for Health. Removing statutory restrictions on how many assistant undersecretaries for health VHA can have and what their professional backgrounds may be will allow VA's healthcare system to adapt to the way healthcare is delivered today and enable VA to recruit and attract the best qualified candidates. As a new ranking member of the Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee, I firmly believe I'm so sorry. Okay, I didn't have, yes, okay. With that, uh, I'm pleased to have this testimony and I yield back. Thank you, Representative Nasty, and I recognize the chief. Thank you, Chairwoman. I want to talk about the Improving Veterans Access to Congressional Services Act and I guess just tell you a story about it. This is not a new program. This has been tested. Since 2017, I opened up the first office in the West Palm Beach VA Medical Center. After that, other colleagues from Florida in my area surrounding the West Palm Beach VA Medical Center started doing the same thing in the same space. We shared a space in the VA where we met with our veteran constituents inside of the hospital. We met with them to deal with their issues. In that time, my office alone opened up more than 500 individual casework and dealt with them. At the time, Rep. Lois Frankel, Rep. Ted Deutsch, Rep. Alcee Hastings, they also worked for their veteran constituents at the same time. In this very moment, I am not given access to the Department of Veterans Affairs to have a, a space to meet with my veteran constituents. But at this very moment, uh, representatives in Orlando, in the VA there, are given access to the VA hospital to meet with their veteran constituents, which I'm glad of, because it gives them the opportunity to be the loudest patient advocates that any member of Congress could be, because they're present. You wanna be in a fight, you gotta be present for it. It gives them the opportunity to be the best overseers of the Department of Veterans Affairs because they're inside of the VA on a weekly basis. Darren Soto, who's been doing this almost as long as I have, is inside of the VA on a weekly basis, seeing what goes right, seeing what goes wrong. Through this program of allowing to be, having access to, to serve our veterans inside of the VA, we've been able to take veterans and help them get appointments. We've been able to take veterans who had their appointments canceled and were in moments of crisis that, that sent them into situations where they wanted to take their lives and help them work through that. We've been able to take them to see the director of the VA hospital so they know that they could be heard at the highest level of the hospital. We've been able to witness things that were just out of place and demand that they be fixed, like in my local hospital at a bathroom in the, the main entrance of the facility, there was no push button to allow people in wheelchairs to have the door open automatically. We've been able to look at places where there should be security but wasn't and demand that there was. We've been able to serve our veterans at a higher level 
There has only been positive outcomes for Democrats and Republicans, and to my knowledge, not one report of misuse ever taking place. So my ask is for the support of this committee to help all members of Congress be the loudest patient advocates and the best possible overseers of the Department of Veterans Affairs and be able to serve our veterans at the highest level by having that space in the VA. And I look forward to answering any questions you all might have. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Mack. Fellow veteran, I know that uh, serving veterans in your community is your highest priority. Uh, Representative Baird, uh, you're now recognized for three minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman Miller Meeks and Ranking Member Brownlee. I also want to thank the committee and the staff for holding this hearing and considering my bill, H.R. 41, the VA Same Day Scheduling Act. This is an important piece of legislation that I was proud to reintroduce this Congress, and I'm hopeful that together we can get across, get it across the finish line. In President Lincoln's second inaugural, he affirmed that this nation would care for those who shall have borne the battle. His words have stood the test of time and stand as a solemn charge as we do our work here, ringing true today as it did back then. This bill is one more step towards fulfilling that promise. The veterans on this subcommittee alone have about 120 years of military service. That's something to be proud of. But we also know too well there are millions of veterans left in limbo when it comes to making appointments for health care. With about 19 million veterans in the United States, timely and reliable care are essential to those who serve. The VA Same Day Service Scheduling Act would improve veterans' experiences with the VA by, by prioritizing the customer service. They served our country, and now it's time to serve them. This common sense measure guarantees that any veteran who makes a phone call and is requesting care is able to schedule their appointment during that phone call. In too many instances, we have seen setbacks that the VA patient scheduling, often the tragic consequences because of delays in callback times to schedule these appointments. My bill is narrow but targeted in scope to guarantee priority for those to establish the VA patients. And so with that, I see I'm out of time. So, uh, no, I'm not. I got another 55 minutes. <laughs> Sorry, I was going to let you know you had some more time. I will give you five more seconds. Okay. My bill is narrowed, but it's targeted to scope with the guaranteed priority for those already established as VA patients. It's specific to care administered by the VA to avoid issues carried out by this task related to the community care system. We must remove our any uncertainty in scheduling VA provided care over the telephone for our veterans. Additionally, it provides for the department considerable flexibility by making the bill applicable to 120 days, applicable 120 days after enactment, and allows sufficient time for the VA to set appropriate standards after the adoption of this law. And I see I'm out of time now, so thank you, Madam Chair, and I yield back. Thank you, Representative Baird. Representative Molinar, you are now recognized for three minutes. Thank you, and uh, good afternoon, uh, Chairwoman Miller Meeks and Ranking Member Brownlee, uh, distinguished members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to come before you today to discuss the Veterans Patient Advocacy Act. After putting their lives on the line in service to our country, our veterans deserve the best care from the VA, and I think that's something we can all agree with. Uh, yet, when I'm back in Michigan, I often hear from veterans that are there are simply not enough patient advocates at the VA. They tell me they struggle getting appointments, feel the VA is letting them down, and think the federal government does not care about them. Patient advocates are specifically trained professionals that play a vital role in helping our veterans with problems related to their care. Whether it's assisting with paperwork or an appeal, patient advocates are there to help. Unfortunately, there are not enough of them. In a recent report on the patient advocacy program, the Government Accountability Office found staffing concerns, massive backlogs, and veterans' calls going unanswered. 
the veterans patient advocacy act would address this problem directly it would require the v a to increase the number of patient advocates available to serve veterans specifically it would mandate that there is at least one patient advocate for every thirteen thousand five hundred veterans enrolled in the system this would amount to seventy eight new patient advocates to help veterans these new patient advocates can address the backlogs and assist our veterans to ensure they receive the care they need. This is bipartisan legislation. I've worked on it with Congresswoman Debbie Dingell. It's also supported by the VFW and Student Veterans of America. I hope you will join us all in supporting it as well. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Molinar. Representative Womack, you're now recognized for three minutes. I thank the Chairwoman. Uh, Chairwoman Miller Meeks, Ranking Member Brownlee, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for considering my bill, H.R. 693, the VA Medical Center Absence and Notification Timeline Act, or Vacant Act. I also want to express my appreciation for allowing me to speak in support of this bill. The Vacant Act is a straightforward and common sense piece of legislation that will strengthen congressional oversight of the Veterans Health Administration's leadership selection process and ultimately improve care for veterans. My bill simply requires the VA to notify the Congressional Veterans Affairs Committees when a medical center director is detailed to a different position within the department and when an acting medical center director is appointed. The bill also puts a limit on the amount of time a director can be detailed before returning to their medical center. This legislation, which I'm proud to lead with my friend Senator John Bozeman, highlights the value of effective, stable leadership at VA medical centers. Like the chair, I've commanded military units, and I fully appreciate how leadership drives culture. Unfortunately, we also both understand how poor leadership or no leadership can harm an organization and that organizations will not operate at peak effectiveness when there is a rotating cast of leaders. Until recently in Arkansas, we faced these leadership issues with the Veterans Health Care System of the Ozarks going almost two years without a permanent director. Although our acting directors were managing the best they could, it's understood that organizations need stable leadership to be as supportive as possible for our veterans. This legislation is an important step to ensuring no other VA medical center is left without a permanent director for a significant amount of time. Large, complex organizations require effective leadership. Effective leaders drive change. They are proactive. Failure to appoint a permanent medical center director was a hardship for the Veterans Health Care System of the Ozarks. I am committed to ensuring our VA support systems are prepared to meet their daily challenges. The Vacant Act is an important step in this direction. Once again, it's an honor for me to speak in support of my legislation today. With your help, we'll move this legislation closer to enacted law. Thank you so much, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Representative Womack. Representative Lesko, you're now recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman Miller-Meeks and Ranking Member Brownlee for inviting me to testify in front of the subcommittee on my bipartisan bill, VA Medical Center Facility Transparency, Transparency Act, H.R. 1089. I'd also like to thank Nevada Congresswoman Susie Lee for being the prime lead on this bill with me. It's hard to believe that it's been almost 10 years since the Phoenix VA Medical Center was on national news because of huge wait times for our veterans seeking care. This bill is critical to helping our veteran constituents by increasing transparency between VA medical facilities, Congress, and the veterans themselves. As the representative of over 50,000 veterans in my district, I believe we must ensure that VA medical facilities are acting in the best interest of their patients. Transparency and accountability are key to building trust and confidence among veterans and their families who rely on VA medical facilities for their health care needs. When VA medical facilities are open and transparent about their practices, policies, and outcomes, quality of care will increase, which is what our veterans des deserve and what we promise to deliver. My bill 
requires each director of a VA medical center to submit an annual, concise, easy to read fact sheet containing statistics regarding the number of veterans treated, the number of appointments conducted, the most common illnesses or conditions treated, the satisfaction of the veterans who are treated at each facility, and a description of any successes or achievements experienced by such facilities. The bill also requires a quarterly fact sheet that provides the average wait time for veterans to receive treatment at the medical facility. This information is critical to ensuring that our veterans receive timely medical care. It is important to note that many of the nation's veterans have unique needs. That is why this bill requires a description of special areas of emphasis or specialization by such facilities. The VA Medical Center Facility Transparency Act is critical to ensuring that our veterans receive the best medical care possible. By increasing transparency and accountability of medical centers, we can improve access to timely and high quality medical care for our nation's heroes. I urge all the members of this committee to support this important legislation on behalf of myself and Congresswoman Susie Lee. I thank you. Thank you, Representative Lesko. As is our, we will forego a round of questioning uh, for our members. You are now excused. We will take a slight recess or break for about five minutes while uh, we get situated for the next panel, and I invite the second panel to the table.
Now that we're situated, thank you all very much. And I would like uh, to thank the Department of Veterans Affairs for joining us today. Um, the members who are here are, um, excuse me, members of the uh, VA administration that are here are Alfred Montoya, who is Deputy Assistant Undersecretary for Health for Operations in the Office of the Deputy Undersecretary for Health. Accompanying Mr. Montoya today are Dr. Scott Hartromp, <laughs> the Executive Director for the Office of Geriatrics and Extended Care, and Mr. David Perry, the Chief Officer with the VHA's Workforce Management. Mr. Montoya, you are now recognized for five minutes to present the Department's testimony. Good afternoon, Chairwoman Miller-Meeks, Ranking Member Bronley, and other members of the subcommittee. First, I would like to apologize formally for the lateness of our testimony. We certainly do heed your comments uh, about that in the beginning, and certainly will work towards uh, getting our uh, testimony in, in, on a more timely fashion. So thank you for those comments. I thank you for inviting us here today to present our view on several bills that would affect VA programs and services. Joining me today are Mr. David Perry, Chief Officer, Workforce Management and Consulting, and Dr. Scotty Hartroff, Executive Director, Geriatrics and Extended Care. VA is grateful for the committee's dedication to providing VA the authority and resources related to access, eligibility, and staffing. HR 41 would require VA to ensure that whenever a covered veteran contacts VA by telephone to request the scheduling of an appointment, the scheduling for the appointment occurred during the telephone call. VA does not support this bill. VA already has the authority to do what this bill proposes, and it does so whenever possible. However, requirements for clinical review and determinations of eligibility are not always possible nor desired by the veteran at the time of a phone call to complete simultaneous appointment scheduling. Additionally, some types of care require specific eligibility, and it is not always possible to know that information during a telephone call. HR 366 would add a new subsection that would state that persons VA has determined served in Vietnam as a member of the Armed Forces of the Republic of Korea between January 9, 1962 and May 7, 1975 would be eligible for benefits as a discharged member of the armed forces of a government. VA does not support this bill. In addition to a technical concern and equity concerns for other nations, there is also a concern about expanding health care eligibility to persons who served in armed forces of other nations before we can fully address expanding eligibility to veterans in priority groups not covered within our own current veteran population. We appreciate the close collaboration in addressing some of the concerns VA identified with previous versions of HR 542. We believe the current version is much improved and is a demonstration of the benefits of VA and Congress working together. VA generally supports this bill if amended, although our positions vary as noted in my written statement. HR 562 would require VA to permit a member of Congress to use a VA facility for the purposes of meeting with constituents. VA opposes this bill because we object to the prescriptive requirements of the bill. Facilities also raise unique concerns that would make placement of an office for a member of Congress inappropriate. HR 693 would require VA to notify Congress within 90 days of detailing a VAMC director to a different position in VA. VA supports this if amended. If unamended, this bill may impact continuity of operations as well as ongoing projects and initiatives that require a VAMC director's leadership. Section 2 of H.R. 754 would establish a commission on eligibility to examine eligibility for VA health care. VA has concerns with the proposed bill and opposes it as currently written. We appreciate the committee's interest in assessing eligibility for VA health care. Eligibility determinations can be quite complex because veterans and other beneficiaries may qualify for the same or similar services under multiple laws. H.R. 808 would require VA to ensure that there is not fewer than one patient advocate for every 13,500 veterans and that highly rural veterans may access the services of patient advocates. Over the last few years, the role of patient advocates has expanded, and we are working to identify the best approach to ensuring veterans can access patient advocacy services as needed to support the delivery of their care. Section 2 of H.R. 1089 would require VA to ensure that each medical center director submits to the secretary, the Committees on Veterans Affairs of the House of Representatives and the Senate, and the appropriate members of Congress an annual fact sheet with certain statistical information with respect to the year covered by the annual fact sheet. VA does not support this bill. We understand the fundamental interest or concern of the bill, but VA already provides significant information online about patient experience, 
wait times, and quality for each medical center. The requirements for each director to submit to Congress directly on an annual basis these fact sheets would be very involved, requiring each facility to establish redundant processes and systems and incur significant additional costs. Finally, VA supports Section 2 of H.R. 1256. Setting a five-year term could provide VA with continuity of operations when there is a change in presidential administrations and could allow VA to continue providing support and care to our nation's veterans without interruption. It would also give VA the flexibility to recruit and retain highly qualified executives with various experience to fill these critical leadership positions. This concludes my statement. We would be happy to answer any questions you or members of the subcommittee may have. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Montoya. I will now yield myself five minutes. Mr. Montoya, currently when a veteran contacts the department by telephone to request the scheduling of an appointment and the request cannot be accommodated during that phone call, what is the typical process for follow-up? Yeah, Chairwoman, thank you so much for that question. When we look at scheduling and when a veteran calls in, I'll actually use some of my own examples as a, a veteran who gets 100% of my care in the VA. So as that veteran calls in, if they're not able to make that appointment for one reason or another, that uh, eligibility or uh, determination of the, the clinical reason would then go on to another provider or clinical staff to be able to, to help schedule that appointment. So a good example of this would be um, dental. Dental is one of those uh, very intricate appointment types where there needs to be some uh, evaluation of, of the benefit uh, as well as the uh, clinical um, application of the appointment. Uh, one average then, how long does it take for a veteran uh, to schedule that scheduled appointment? Yes, yeah, so I'm very happy to actually share some of our wait time data uh, that we do have for the community. And so for the exact uh, time frame as far as when it, uh, when it takes uh, a veteran to uh, get their appointment scheduled. I'll certainly uh, get back to you on that one for the record. I will tell you in some cases, we do this already um, the same time that that veteran calls in. So if it's a very basic uh, appointment such as primary care or mental health, in many cases we can do that the same day. Uh, and in some cases we actually have a clinical contact center that does that 24-7, 365 days a year. So I'll let you know that I'm a physician and when patients call me to schedule an appointment, we schedule that appointment the same day. We don't have them call back. Um, what if they walk in, I see them, I don't ask for their insurance or what their benefits are, I take care of that patient. Um, in addition to which, I understand the challenges that you're having, but there are oftentimes when veterans have uh, extremely uh, extreme need and need to be addressed, and we know one of those because we have a bill named after a veteran who committed suicide who could not get into the VA and was declined service um, or not made an appointment uh, in a timely fashion. So it's a bill that I support. I understand uh, the challenges that you face at the VA, but I think that um, sometimes when uh, there's a will, there's a way, and perhaps we need to give the VA the will uh, to make the way happen. Um, when a veteran contacts a call center, um, shouldn't they be able to complete that scheduling request in a single call? It sounds like you're supportive of that. Yes, ma'am, and uh, you know, thank you for that. And as I did mention uh, in my previous answer, you know, many of our uh, basic appointments, such as primary care or mental health, uh, those are scheduled on the same day. And in fact, when veterans do call into our clinical contact centers, mm -hmm. they are able to, to schedule those appointments. Where it does actually present an, an opportunity or a challenge is when there are some of those more complex medical appointments, such as cardiology or dental, as I mentioned <coughs> with my previous example, where it does take more time to dig into what the eligibility is, what the clinical concern is, to make sure that we're scheduling the right appointment for that veteran at the right time. Okay. Um, in your view, how would veterans benefit from having representatives of their members of Congress available in VA facilities during business hours? Yeah, thank you so much for that question as well. As a former medical center director of three different stations, uh, I can't underscore enough the importance of the relationship with our congressional stakeholders in the community. Uh, oftentimes we hear those concerns from them first, first and foremost about our veterans. And uh, when they're in, our, in the facility, uh, we actually run into a couple of concerns. Uh, first and foremost, our uh, primary reason for our medical centers is to provide that space for clinical care. Uh, oftentimes in our medical center, there is not enough space uh, to be able to do that. And so we do feel that uh, having that blanket requirement uh, to provide office space would detract from that clinical care or the potential for that clinical care to be provided. 
Additionally, when you look at it, there are other things that come alongside that, such as parking, the uh, flow going into the campuses and the like, that uh, tend to be a little detracting. So your conference rooms are full 24 seven? They are not, in fact, um, thank you for that, because I think there are the opportunities for our congressional members to on an ad hoc uh, basis, to be able to coordinate space within those medical centers. Uh, all they have to do is reach out to their medical center director and uh, they can work through the process of making that happen. And thank you very much. As a fellow veteran, I think sometimes it's good to go into the VA hospital when you're unannounced and not having an, a, an officially guided tour. Um, thank you and I'm gonna yield uh, five minutes to um, Ranking Member Brownlee. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, appreciate it. Um, uh, Dr. Hartroff, um, I wanted to ask you a couple of quick questions here at the beginning. Um, and I would just appreciate if you could just answer yes or no, okay? Um, so is home and community-based care good uh, for veterans? Do veterans who use home and community care generally have positive experiences and good health outcomes? Yes, ma'am. Uh, is home and community-based care usually less expensive than institutionalized care? Yes, ma'am, in some cases. Uh, how many veterans does VA ex expect would benefit by increasing, in Section 2 of the bill, by increasing uh, the cap to, uh, to 100 uh, percent? We don't have the exact number, but the populations that are primarily affected by the current cap are veterans with ALS and also some spinal cord injury and disorder patients, and especially when they need ventilator care or 24-7 uh, care the primary population that most likely has issues with the cap. So the in no way does the bill say that uh, everyone, every veteran who receives uh, home-based care would use the full amount. No, ma'am. It would be a, a much smaller amount. We would estimate that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, you know, you've you estimated um, a one point to approximately billion dollars in terms of the cost. Um, Mr. Montoya, maybe you know this, but there had to be a, some kind of an assumption of how many veterans would utilize the cap at 100%, at roughly 200, 500? In the I can bring those to you for the record exact numbers, but again, we were primarily looking at those populations that were specifically hitting the cap. Okay, I'm looking for like exact numbers because we have some work to do with 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 CBO, so um, I, you know, I, I would definitely, um, definitely, definitely like those numbers. So, um, so do you think um, the way CBO, because CBO did score this at you know roughly twenty four billion dollars, which is you know quite different from your one point two billion dollars um, that, that's quite a difference do you think that what they did was they assumed that everyone every veteran that would utilize the home-based care uh, they scored it at a hundred percent do you think that's how they possibly came up with a 24 billion dollar figure my apologies, but I can't really comment on the CBO's methodology. <laughs> the secretary said the same thing. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're not going to comment on this, then I need you to comment on how you came to your conclusion of what you think the bill costs. Yes, ma'am. Because we've got to figure out this discrepancy. Okay? Yes. Okay. Um, so um, I, I, I guess then, you know, I would just go on to to um, you know, ask if did the CBO ask the VA for data um, to make their assessments of costs? I'm unaware and can't comment on uh, how much they reached out. Wait, are you unaware or you can't comment? I'm unaware. <laughs> okay, good. All right, very okay. So unaware. So we've just got to get kind of kind of get to the bottom of this. I know on the Senate side of the bill there equally as interested um, in, in figuring this out. And I know this is a section of the bill that the VA absolutely, um, absolutely supports. So, um, you know, again, if you can give me the exact numbers for the record, I would appreciate it. And with that, I yield back. Thank you, Representative Brownlee. Um, I'd now like to uh, recognize uh, General Bergman for five minutes. 
Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, as you all know, I guess let's start with first things first. To any of our fellow Vietnam veterans, March 29th, several years ago, was designated uh, Vietnam Veterans Day. Welcome home. Um, I would like to extend that welcome home to all our fellow brothers and sisters and for all of you in the VSOs and the VA community who serve. Um, in, in my case, uh, my, my generation of, of veterans, uh, it's not too little too late, but it was too late for some. And as we look at providing care for veterans now in their 70s and 80s, uh, that the dynamics of health care have changed. So with the, the reason I would start with that is that, you know, with uh, H.R. 542, the Elizabeth Dole uh, Community-Based Services for Veterans and Caregiver Act. Um, Mr. Montoya, what, what does VA consider to be the cost of 100% institutional care? Now, I know it could may possibly vary by geography or that cost of, you know, living, whatever. But what factors go into determining that cost? Yeah, General, thank you so much for that question. And, and for that, I'm going to actually turn to my colleague, uh, Dr. Hartroft, uh, to be able to answer this. this okay. Yes, and uh, yes, sir. Uh, and it takes into, it does vary from region to region, as you're aware. Uh, but what we re usually look at is the, the average cost for a region for the VA Community Living Center uh, is kind of what we look at. And then we adjust that cap with the 65% to the average. Uh, so that's definitely that's kind of how we peg to that. So when you're when we're costing out, then what we're going to do with, um, if you will, community-based services? Do you feel that you have a? Uh, I mean, a really here's the cost of providing this in Roanoke, Virginia, or Escanaba, Michigan, that you can compare and contrast the costs associated with home-based health care, that we're, that we're not using a metric that doesn't really match the geographic area so we can you can determine how, how much this is going to cost? Uh, that's why we uh, currently uh, support the not only the 100 percent, but then also the waiver availability uh, for both certain conditions that exceed that. But uh, yes, we would be interested in meeting and going specific into VA methodologies. Uh, in more detail, if you're able to see. Uh, we accept and understand that there could be different, there could be cost variances in different parts of the country. But unless VA can, through your procedures for evaluating cost, give us, as members of Congress, who would appropriate money to the VA for, you know, general funds or, or specific programs, um, some, sometimes we get a little nervous that we're throwing, we're, we're not getting the right cost benefit for the dollar. So I, I, I just, I for one like to see numbers and I'm, I'm not afraid of cost comparisons because it either it is worth the value or it's not. And how do we balance that, that, that spectrum of care? Because if, if we, um, and we, and this is kind of a partnership between the House and, and VA, don't have our fiscal act together when it comes to implementing good programs for care, the confidence that the veterans and their families, and even within your systems, within your visions, one might feel handicapped, you know, by the numbers, other one might feel advantaged by the numbers because it, it came out in their favor. So I guess, I, you know, I, I see my time is running out here. Anything that the VA can do to give realistic numbers for all of us to take a look at as we make these decisions is, is going to be helpful in the end to the care we provide for the veterans. And in the end, all of us, all of us will, will be proud of what we did and it will vary a little bit. So I just wanted to say thank you for all you do, and let's not quit, because we've got a lot of veterans out there and their families who are counting on us. So with that, Madam Chairwoman, I yield back. Thank you. The chair now recognizes Representative Budzinski from uh, Illinois for five minutes.
Thank you, Chairwoman. Um, it's great to be with all of you. Thank you for being here. Um, I actually had a, a question I wanted to ask about H.R. 542, the Elizabeth Dole Home Care Act, introduced actually by Ranking Member Brownlee. I've heard from many of the veterans back in my district and from several VSOs on the need to enable elderly and disabled veterans to be able to enjoy a higher quality of life at home as they age, as well as the increasing need to support their caregivers. According to the VA Geriatric and Gerontology Advisory Committee, over half of the VHA enrolled veterans are 65 or older, and this population is only increasing meaning we need to take immediate action to support long-term care and invest in VA's home and community-based services, especially those in rural areas like the district that I represent, uh, where healthcare options are already limited. Um, so really my first question is for anyone on the panel, um, what challenges do current caregivers and elderly veterans face, and how do you think this bill in particular uh, works to address some of those concerns? for that question, ma'am. Uh, actually, this bill has been very helpful in us aligning our timelines. As you all may be aware, we currently have had a multi-year expansion for many of our programs in home community-based. Mm -hmm. and, and due to feedback, from, and we had previously said we were going to make vet directed care be available at all VAs over five years. Mm -hmm. But recently, due to feedback from this subcommittee and others and external uh, stakeholders, we've actually compressed that now to where we're going to do it over eight quarters. So we're going to go from 71 sites that were available in, in, mm -hmm. in 2022 to where we're going to add over 70 more sites uh, over the next eight quarters. Uh, we also were expanding the number of home-based primary care and also medical foster home, which is in a program that's uh, well known. So right now we've also made a homemaker home health care, purchase skilled home care, and home-based primary care is now available at all VAs. So now we're working on getting that vet-directed care and medical foster home to all VAs. Uh, as well as trying to make uh, veterans known. I think some of the barriers, of course, is especially in rural areas. Mm -hmm. And it, it's not, uh, and, it, and it's a problem for all of the American uh, demographics, not just for veterans in the sense that there may not be many vendors or home health care agencies in many of the rural areas or highly rural areas. And that's why many people really like the veteran directed care program where they can hire a family member, neighbor, mm -hmm. and others to fill in that gap. And that has really helped us in many significant rural areas. So and we're mm -hmm. also trying to push the, the limits when it comes to, uh, to telehealth and other mm -hmm. modalities to really kind of improve access to our rural veterans and others who can't get it by traditional means. Right, that's great to hear. And I actually have a follow-up question in the same vein. Um, there's also a critical need to address the complex and unique uh, mental health concerns, of course, of aging vets. Again, for anyone on the panel, um, how can this bill help address the behavioral health concerns older veterans are facing today? I think for us, uh, especially with behavioral health and mental health, covers many aspects unique to veterans as well as the, that of aging uh, in mm -hmm. itself, with whether you have dementia or other reasons. So. Uh, we work closely with the Office of Mental Health and Suicide Prevention, and we look at both how we can improve both the home care level as well as, as making sure that uh, our institutional facilities are aware of veteran-specific unique needs as well as behaviors, mm -hmm. especially as you see in certain populations of aging veterans with dementia and, and other disorders. So a lot of it's education, training, uh, availability of services, and us working closely with the Mental Health Program Office. Great, thank you. I guess I'd just lastly like to say I'm really a proud co-sponsor um, of the Elizabeth Dole Home Care Act, um, and I'm grateful to my colleagues on both sides of the aisle because it does have a lot of really great bipartisan support. So thank you again for being here today, and I, I yield back my time. Thank you. The chair now recognizes Representative Von Norden from Wisconsin for five minutes. Thank you very much, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, write this down. I, <clears throat> I agree <laughs> with Congressman Takano. Um, so I think that's a first, <laughs> and he's right. These, uh, these Korean War veterans served alongside my Uncle Bob, Robert Francis Mulligan, who was nearly killed by a Chinese communist grenade thrown into his pit. They became American citizens. These aren't just random people on the street. So I completely disagree with you, Mr. Montoya. These people deserve the respect that they earned fighting next to our relatives. Um, did you say you support H.R. 1256, because I didn't hear that. That's the uh, five-year term and that sort of stuff? Yes, sir, we do. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to talk to you about HR 562. I'm 100% disabled 
uh, service-connected disabled veteran, my care has been outstanding. Uh, the one issue that I've had consistently with the VA is the bureaucracy involved with it. I noticed that your testimony was re requested a month ago. It, we got it last night. Could you say that your testimony was lost in the bureaucracy? Probably. Okay, let's put that one there. Um, Senior Chief Mike Day committed suicide two days ago. He was shot 27 times in Iraq. His primary weapon was disabled. He drew his pistol and he killed the three people in the room that shot him 27 times. Um, we have to have an on-ramp into the VA. I've had good experiences with the VA, but a lot of those people wearing the same hat that I got back there did not. And I'll tell you why. It's because we walk into the VA and you don't know anybody. You don't. If we're able to walk into the VA and see someone who was sent by them to represent them, that's a friendly agent. And I will do anything I possibly can to prevent another damn veteran suicide. So by excluding us, if we're sitting in a room, and I've been to, I don't know how many VA facilities, so that we can be the friendly on-ramp for our veterans so they can get into the system and not kill themselves is imperative. And I'm concerned because I do not believe what you just testified. I do not believe that you think there is not enough room for this. I don't believe that. What I do believe is that your agency is concerned about having on the ground oversight by congressional people who control your budget, and that is unacceptable. That is putting your job and the jobs of the rest of these cats here in front of my uh, brothers and sisters in arms, and I will not accept that. So you guys need to change your opinion on that. Um, H.R. 1256 says uh, it can allow for more flexible numbers of assistant undersecretaries, correct? That is correct. And you're capped at eight, right? Um, can you envision any scenario if you have flexible options that that number would become seven? Yes, yeah, so thank you very much for that question, sir. For that, I'm going to turn to Mr. Perry uh, to be able to answer. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you for that question. I think what we're looking for is the flexibility to not have a predefined number of assistants. I get you. I'm just asking you a pretty clear question, Mr. Perry. You're capped at A right now. Can you envision that ever becoming seven? It could potentially, yes. Well, I could potentially grow my hair back, but the chances of that happening are zero, right? So, no. This is the problem here. The only one of these things that you vigorously supported was growing the bureaucracy. The only reason your testimony was a month late is because of your bureaucracy. The only problem I've ever had with the VA is with the bureaucracy. So we got to stop this. I'm not going to vote to grow the bureaucracy. I will grow to refine the bureaucracy. I'll, I'll vote to make sure that you're empowered to do your job better, that, that my uh, fellow rep, uh, reps on this, this panel have the ability to conduct oversight so it can become more efficient, but I'm not voting for this. It's just, it's inappropriate. I mean, my goodness, this whole pack of them, the only thing you supported was growing your bureaucracy. That's not good. We cannot have another veteran commit suicide because of bureaucracy. And there's a, there's a, a framed letter on my desk from a veteran, his brother, who wrote me who committed suicide and they got the letter two days later that he got accepted to the VA because of the bureaucracy. So his request was lost with your testimony, and we've had enough of that. With that, I yield back. Thank you, Representative. On behalf of the committee, I thank uh, all of our witnesses for their testimony and for joining us today. You are now excused, and we'll wait a moment as the third panel comes to the witness table.
Welcome, everyone, and I thank you for your participation today. On our third panel, we have Mr. John Retzer, Assistant National Legislative Director with Disabled American Veterans, Mrs. Tiffany Ellett, the Deputy Director of Health Policy for the American Legion, and Mr. Morgan Brown, National Legislative Director for the Paralyzed Veteran of Paralyzed Veterans of America. Mr. Retzer, you are now recognized for five minutes. Chairwoman Miller Meeks, Ranking Member Brownlee, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting DAV to testify at this legislative hearing. I will focus my remarks on the bills under consideration today that most affect service disabled veterans. DAV is pleased to support HR 542, the Elizabeth Dole Home Care Act. By 2037, the age cohorts are the greatest need for long-term care, veterans who are at least 85 years, and those who have disability ratings of 70% or higher which guarantees mandatory long-term care, is expected to grow by almost 600%. Cost of long-term care services support must double by 2037 just to maintain our current services. In order to meet the overwhelming increasing demand for long-term care needs for the veterans in the years ahead, VA must significantly expand and fund home and community-based services as proposed in HR 542. The programs are not only more affordable but often preferred by veterans and their families. We also support the increasing of the expenditure cap for home and community services to create the financial incentives to expand these important services. DAV is pleased to support HR 41, the same day scheduling act. In the recent years, the Government Accountability Office and others have reviewed VA scheduling process and identified very specific challenges that the Veterans Health Administration has in ensuring all appointments including those at community care, are scheduled in a timely manner. This legislation would require VA to schedule an appointment during the veteran's telephone call, regardless of the prospective date of the appointment being scheduled. This would improve the current scheduling procedures at the VA and provide more accurate wait time data. DAV also supports HR 808. The bill would improve the patient advocates program at VA medical facilities by ensuring there are no fewer than one patient advocate for every 13,500 veterans. Patient advocates play a critical role in assisting veterans to get the care they need. They have direct effect, the ability to address veterans' complaints and resolve issues with access to care. Importantly, patient advocates also assist veterans with clinical appeals. Advocates should be able to provide timely assistance to veterans in accessing health care and the clinical appeals process. Therefore, we recommend additional research be conducted to ensure that the ratio of patient advocate to veterans is adequate and balanced. DAV supports HR 693, the Vacant Act, legislation that would limit the dealing, detailings of the VA Medical Center director to the different position within the department. Staffing shortages and vacancies in the VA healthcare system, especially the critical management positions, can impede the delivery of care for veterans who rely on VA for their care. This legislation would help improve accountability to sustain needed leadership to ensure VA health care runs seamlessly during a period of transition and that veterans' continuity of care and benefits are not disrupted. H.R. 1256 would extend the term of appointment for the Undersecretary for Health to five years and remove restrictions for the number of Assistant Undersecretary for Health that can be appointed. We understand the intent of this bill is to provide greater leadership stability at the VHA and believe it would empower the Undersecretary for Health to more effectively manage and carry out their responsibilities to ensure veterans' health care needs are met. While DEV does not have a resolution that speaks to this issue, we have no objections to moving this bill forward. The final bill I will comment on is H.R. 754. This legislation would establish a commission to examine policies guiding veterans' health care eligibility and make recommendations. If advisable, make changes. DAV is concerned that previous reform efforts have proposed to diminish the size and scope of the veterans' health care system, whether by proposing changes in eligibility to limit the number of veterans who may have received care, or by pressing for privatization of the VA medical services. Historically, Congress has made thoughtful decisions about assigning priority for care and eligibility for various veteran groups. Most recently, Congress expanded eligibility for veterans who experienced combat, and were exposed to toxic exposures or radiation under the COMPACT Act, veterans in mental health crisis under the COMPACT Act. Rather than a commission, we believe Congress should continue to make these decisions in the best interest of veterans 
by conducting oversight of VA healthcare eligibility and legislating the changes that are deemed necessary. Chairwoman Miller-Meeks, this concludes my statement. I'm happy to address questions you or the members of the subcommittee may have. Thank you, Mr. Ritzner. Uh, the chair now recognizes uh, Ms. Ellett. You are recognized for five minutes. I sit before you today as a disabled veteran, a VA patient, and a veteran advocate. I receive all of my care through the Department of Veteran Affairs and have personally experienced the evolution of the VA benefit and health care system since my separation from the United States Army in 2013. It is through this lens that I'm able to see what our members see, to feel the frustrations and aggravation they exude when discussing obtaining an appointment, navigating the system, and receiving appropriate care. With their voices in mind, I would like to take this opportunity to touch on a few points. Chairwoman Miller-Meeks, Ranking Member Brownlee and distinguished members of the subcommittee, on behalf of our national commander, Vincent J. Jim Troyola, and our more than 1.6 million dues-paying members, we thank you for inviting the American Legion to testify today. VA has made a number of changes to appointment scheduling through their website, healthcare facilities, and updated internet applications. However, there are still veterans having difficulty scheduling an appointment within the setting of a phone call to their VA facility. With the current process for appointment scheduling via phone, many veterans are able to successfully obtain an appointment in that time frame. However, others are told they will need to be contacted at a later date, with some going weeks without follow-up. At times, this can make a simple task tedious and cause frustrations. In Dorn VA, Columbia, South Carolina, there's a pilot program where staff can schedule an appointment without spending time on technical issues or information searching. Instead, all necessary information for scheduling is in a single sign-on interface. In this one screen, the scheduler can see all open appointment times and days for not only VA providers, but also for the community care provider to which the veteran was referred. With this type of system, scheduling an appointment takes an average of about seven minutes. This is ideal for simplifying the scheduling needs of a veteran. The American Legion supports the VA Same Day Scheduling Act of 2023 and its intent to increase and simplify access to veterans' care. Separately, in 2003, the American Legion dubbed the VA healthcare system a system worth saving, and in doing so created a program where veterans and local VA medical center staff could meet with us to discuss the challenges and successes in delivering and receiving efficient health care. In the last three trips we've, had, we've conducted, the American Legion has found that VA patient advocates are utilized by both veterans and VA with the same goal in mind successful navigation through the VA healthcare system. As expected, with the increase of veterans enrolling in VA care, the patient advocates have a heavy workload and at times are not able to assist veterans to the extent needed. The American Legion supports the Veteran Patient Advocacy Act and the improvements it will bring through establishing a standard of at least one advocate per 13,500 veterans. We are also encouraged to see an increase in access to patient advocates for veterans in rural communities. The availability of patient advocates is a priority of the American Legion and will continue to be a focal point when speaking with veterans about the about their representation as a VA patient. Finally, I would like to address the Elizabeth Dole Home and Community-Based Services for Veterans and Caregivers Act of 2023. Recently, our national commander testified that there is a concern for caregivers and their health. Often, caregivers will put their veterans' health and care above their own, leading them toward poor health and burnout. The American Legion is pleased to see that respite care is addressed in this legislation as it is beneficial to caregivers, their families, and the veterans they care for. We are also pleased to see consideration given to caregivers in terms of support services and education on possible benefits. We also agree that successful transition and care are critical to the overall well-being of both the caregiver and the veteran. As consistently stated by Secretary McDonough, VA has a priority of providing timely world-class health care to veterans. The American Legion supports the necessary legislation to help VA accomplish this endeavor. We've seen VA work to identify deficiencies, and we've seen members of Congress work with VA to create solutions. The American Legion supports VA as they continue to evolve. We also call upon Congress to pass legislation such as these to allow for and encourage VA's evolution toward health equity for veterans. I conclude by thanking Chair Chairwoman Miller-Meeks, Ranking Member Brownlee, and this subcommittee for your incredible leadership and for always keeping veterans at the forefront of your mission. It is my privilege to represent the American Legion for this subcommittee. 
and look and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Um, Ella. The chair now recognizes Mr. Brown. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Chairwoman Miller Meeks, Ranking Member Brownlee, and members of the subcommittee, Paralyzed Veterans of America thanks you for this opportunity to present our views on pending legislation impacting the Department of Veterans Affairs that is before the subcommittee. My written statement covered PVA's positions on the nine bills being reviewed today. So in the interest of time, I'm going to focus on the one bill that most directly impacts our membership. PVA gives its strongest endorsement to H.R. 542, the Elizabeth Dole Home Care Act, which would make urgently needed improvements to VA's home and community-based services, including several that target our concerns about current program shortfalls. VA projects the demand for long-term care will continue to increase, driven in part by growing numbers of aging veterans, and veterans with service-connected disabilities. Expenditures for long-term care will increase as well and are projected to double by 2037. While greater investment in the department's long-term care infrastructure is badly needed, VA must also expand veterans' access to non-institutional programs when appropriate to prevent or delay nursing home care and to reduce costs. Fixing VA's challenges to meet veterans' long-term care needs will be difficult because it is a multi-dimensional problem that requires a comprehensive solution. Section 2 of this bill raises the cap on how much VA can pay for the cost of home care. Currently, VA is prohibited from spending more than 65% of what it would cost to care for the veteran in a nursing home. When VA reaches this cap, the department can either place the veteran into a VA or community care facility at a significantly higher cost or rely on the veteran's caregivers who are often family members to bear the extra burden. Depending on the services available in their area, some veterans must turn to their state's Medicaid program to receive the care they need, even for service-connected disabilities. Last month, the Senate Veterans Affairs Committee advanced a similar version of this bill without the language raising VA's cap on care, primarily due to its cost. CBO's score for this section is perplexing because only a few hundred veterans are currently exceeding the 65% threshold. Some may need rates to be raised to the full cost of nursing home care, but the majority would not. VA is committed to enhancing and maintaining the quality of life for veterans, but the current limitations on the cap of services is contrary to this vision. Nothing in this legislation expands the number of veterans in this category, and the number of them in this situation is relatively stable from year to year. We recommend the subcommittee work with CBO and your Senate counterparts to review the current calculations to determine their accuracy. Section 4 of the bill requires the VA to administer programs like Veterans Directed Care at all VA medical centers within two years. The VDC program allows veterans to receive HCBS in a consumer-directed way and is designed for veterans who need personal care services and help with their activities of daily living. Last year, the VA announced plans to expand the VDC program to 75 additional sites over a five-year period, and we were pleased when VA's Undersecretary for Health recently directed VHA to accelerate that timeline. We understand several sites may be ready to launch their programs, but lack the financial resources to do so. We urge Congress to provide the necessary funding so every VA medical center can offer a robust VDC program as quickly as possible. And finally, even when veterans have access to programs like VDC or Homemaker Home Health, it can be challenging to find home care workers. One PVA member told us he regularly spends weekends in bed because no staff is available to assist him, and he is depressed and frustrated because he can't find the direct care workers he needs. The shortage of caregivers or direct care workers is not unique to VA. Across the country, there is an increasing shortage of direct care workers, and a national effort is needed to expand and strengthen the workforce. We believe the pilot program established in Section 7 would lessen the difficulty in finding direct care workers at the sites VA selects and may reveal additional ways the VA could alleviate this problem for many veterans nationwide. I close again by stressing that this important bill addresses several major concerns for catastrophically disabled veterans, and we urge Congress to pass the Elizabeth Dole Act this year. And I thank you again for this opportunity to share our views on this legislation, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. 
Thank you so much, Mr. Brown. Um, I'm going to go uh, last as my prerogative. I think uh, my predecessor did that as well, so I'm now going to recognize Ranking Member Brownlee for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Brown, thank you for your testimony. Um, given the population of veterans that PVA serves, I was sadly unsurprised uh, to see the significant challenges veterans and their families face due to statutory cap on how much VA can spend on home care you highlighted in your testimony. So for, for those who didn't get a chance to read his testimony or review it, uh, would you briefly highlight uh, some of those issues and the impact on veterans' quality of life? Certainly. Um, so we have numerous veterans that have um, their family is attempting to provide their care and because of the cap, and VA has limited the number of hours, uh, they have to make a choice, basically. They're forced to choose between going into either a VA facility uh, or into a local facility, which oftentimes provides them a lesser quality of care, uh, or to have the family assume that burden. And in many cases, it is the family that's attempting to do the right thing here and to care for their loved one in the home. Uh, many of these veterans, and I believe it was touched on earlier, are veterans with ALS that are, are in their final years in life. And it's um, a great disappointment to us that we cannot figure out a way to provide them the full care that they earned and deserve. Thank you for that. And you mentioned, uh, you know, in your testimony that you thought it, you know, j there would just be really, there's a couple of hundred veterans, you believe? It is, yes, ma'am. It's, it's our understanding uh, that it is only a few hundred veterans that are currently exceeding the cap and that not all, all not all would require 100 percent. So you may have some that maybe need 70 percent, some that need 80. Certainly there are some that would need uh, the full increase. Very good. The number is stable yeah. from year to year. Very good. And where did you get that data from? Uh, from from uh, talking with our own members and then with conversations with VA. <laughs> okay, very good. Well, the VA has promised me those numbers on the record. record. Um, so, um, so uh, uh, Mr. Brown, really this is a question for all three of you. So, you know, there's a section in the bill I think that the VA is – you know, not necessarily supporting, and that is about um, transparency and having a singular website with all of these services together on a website so a veteran uh, knows where to go and doesn't have to go to five, five or six different sites to figure out what, what programs and services are out there. One centralized location on a website to get that information. Do you think that's a good idea? Absolutely. <laughs> Ms. Elliott? Yes, I absolutely think that that's a good idea. Um, I am, um, I was an analyst in the Army and I can find those things and that's, I can spend all day on that. I'm also a veteran advocate, so it's kind of my job. So, uh, but my wife has five head injuries and for her, if she's going to find, if she's going to look for any resources, um, if she has to go past two clicks, it's not going to work. Yeah. Um, so it, in order to benefit our our caregivers and our veterans, I think that it's not a hard ask to have them all in one location. Very good. Yes, we agree, too. I think uh, the veterans' experience, as VA speaks about it, should be as simple and easy and streamlined in the virtual world along with the VA health care that they get. Yeah, I think, Mr. Brown, in your written testi testimony, I think you had a case where uh, there was a veteran... Um, was associated with a medical center that had the directed care program. He needed that program, but the two never came together. That is correct. Actually, that was our national president. Oh, my goodness. Um, that was, uh, he's currently in home, uh, home health program, and uh, it wasn't until last year that we realized that veterans directed care was available at the facility that serves him. And uh, he had a little bit of difficulty contacting the staff, but when he did uh, and inquired uh, about why he wasn't, you know, offered that program, 
uh, they told him that they felt that he uh, probably would have difficulty finding the workers that he needs to care for him. But in fact, the opposite was true. He actually had people that were willing to step forward and care for him, and it would have been an, an ideal situation for him to participate in that program. Terrific. Thank you so much. I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative um, Brownlee. I now recognize um, Representative uh, Von Norden from Wisconsin for five minutes. The angry senior chief. I'm just fun kidding, Matt. Um, hey, Mr. Esther, I understand you support the, the bill that I don't, and it's not that I don't support the whole thing. It's just I don't want to grow the bureaucracy. Having, having, uh, having the term longer for the secretary I think is a great thing because it does get rid of that gap. But again, we got to... We need to work for efficiencies. Um, Ms. Ellett, is your wife a vet? Yes, is, she, is she getting taken care of now? Yes, she is. Where does she get seen? Uh, we both go to um, Richmond, the AMC. We're also rural veterans. So, so am I. Yeah. It takes us about 45 minutes to get to a local uh, CBOC um, okay. and about an hour and a half to get to the VA Medical Center. So when we make appointments, we make them all day, make yeah. them for the whole day, and it's a, it's a day trip for the both of us. Have you had problems getting access to community care? Um, yes and no. Some, some of the community care providers are very, uh, we get the referral quickly, um, and some of the community care providers are very helpful and very willing to work. Uh, working through a third party administrator is a little bit difficult yeah. because they have you on the phone and they have somebody else on the phone and um, so we have had those same day struggles however when we do schedule for like a, our CBOC it's immediate we can we can call and schedule an appointment like that it's the community care appointments that have the real problem with uh, the same day scheduling okay well thank you for that and, and uh, you know that you have friends here on this committee right yes sir okay and I'm a I'm a legionnaire myself um, HR 562 uh, does anybody on this panel believe that the VA cannot find space for us to see veterans that come in to visit to hopefully get care and benefits? Mr. Retchell, let's start with you. So DAV is a resolution-based organization. We don't have a resolution that supports that. However, in our experiences that we have, I think that's something that Congress can definitely look into with uh, you know, the administration to see what spaces they have. We know that they have some challenges with regards to some localities not having the conference rooms available and things of that nature, but yeah. definitely we would uh, be willing to work with you to see if we can assist that process. Okay. Ma'am, Army guy. <laughs> what Were you an intelligence analyst? Mm -hmm. You said you're an analyst? Yes, I was an intelligence analyst. What was your MOS? Uh, 35 Fox. Okay, roger that. Did you go to Wachuca? I did. Okay, check. <laughs> um, so do you think uh, we should be able to see our fellow vets? So we have a lot of veterans that, um, first, thank you for that question. You're um, welcome. We have a lot of veterans who do communicate with our Congress individuals, um, especially our rural veterans. Uh, they would like to interact more um, due to, you know, more representation, more representation opportunities. Um, however, we don't have a specific position on that. Um, we are talking about taking it back to our members. It would be nice to have that kind of direct communication. Um, as far as space, I know that I've been to quite a few um, VA facilities, and uh, they are struggling to find space for their, their services. Mm -hmm. um, however, it's, it's, it's going to be a compromise. So if, if that's how they move forward, then I'm sure that they can, we, we can all figure it out. It would be awesome if you brought that back to our fellow Legionnaires. Absolutely. Um, because I, I honestly believe I think they're afraid of oversight. Sir, Mr. Brown. So um, availability space is always a perennial concern sure. in VA. It sounds like we're all in agreement here. Um, PVA didn't take a formal position on this bill. I read your stuff. Really supportive of it. Okay. And um, with like DAV, we certainly would hope that the committee and VA will be able to work something out. Excellent, thank you. So I'd, I'd like to go on a record again to say that the vast majority of my health care provided by the VA is excellent. I'm incredibly proud of our my local office in, in La Crosse. I also go to Toma. That's where that whole uh, the drug stuff started. Um, I'm very, very proud of them. I'm also very proud of you. And uh, it takes a lot of guts to come here and speak in front of these committees. And uh, you're doing a good thing. And 
you're helping my brothers and sisters, of which you are also. So God bless you guys, and you take care and take care of your wife, will you? All right, with that, I yield back. Thank you, Representative uh, Von Orden. I now recognize myself for five minutes. Um, and I'll just go down the panel. Um, do VSOs have space in VA medical centers, Mr. Retzer? So for the DAV, we are fortunate to have space where we have our transportation program that's in there with our hospital service coordinators. And at the same time, many of the times we have the VAM Rocks, which have national service officers co-located inside, or we have national service officers that are close by at federal buildings. Ms. Allen? Thank you. Um, yes, so we do have uh, we do have some space. Uh, we share typically with other uh, other VSOs. We have our representatives or our service officers that do have space in most VAs, um, usually with DAV or um, PVA in the same in the same office. Mr. Brown. Uh, yes, ma'am. PVA does have space in many VA uh, facilities. Uh, the majority of those are the spinal cord injury centers and the hub locations. So having been a nurse who uh, worked on the neurosurgery floor at Walter Reed, um, I'm, I'm glad that you have some space, but it also seems to me that if VSOs have space in uh, VA medical centers, that members of Congress who want to meet with their constituents and fellow veterans uh, should also. Uh, so thank you for your, uh, your candid answers. Uh, Ms. Ellett, in your uh, testimony, you mentioned that many uh, medical centers are trying to make sc the scheduling process easier, but it varies from vision to vision. What are your members' experiences when trying to schedule an appointment via a call center? Um, typically, call centers uh, will have to, um, they have to log out of one, um, one VAMC and into another area, uh, which usually takes more time. Um, so, and there's also more confusion with that. Like I said, that, that there is a pilot program that's, I think it's in Vision 8. Um, and they are, it is a call center that has that, that one screen. Um, so, and, it, and it's able to combine um, 14 v, uh, VA instances. So, you know, a, a person doesn't have to log out of one and log into another. So it makes it a lot easier. But um, there are some it depends on the vision. Uh, there are some that are very responses. There are individuals that are very willing to assist and move mountains to help make those appointments happen. And there are others that are less motivated. Yes, yeah, thank you. And, uh, and I also provided uh, community care and uh, took care of veterans uh, as uh, part of my practice. And uh, you had mentioned that mu uh, many uh, community care referrals require multiple phone calls to an established an appointment. So how can this bill impact that progress process, and is there anything we need to add? Um, with that bill, I'm, we're hoping that with that bill, there's more of the uh, technology of the pilot might, might happen, um, and you would also have the buy-in with the, with the community care providers. But um, I think with, the, with, the, with this legislation that we don't want to get lost in making an appointment happen that day or uh, scheduling an appointment that day, but losing the inequality. We don't want to lose any quality of care or any kind of um, anything to take care of the veteran. We don't want anything negative, n any negative impact with it. So that's what we're concerned about. Understood. Um, with the PACT Act increasing eligibility, I'm even more concerned about scheduling processes and delays in CARES. Many veterans prefer online portals and direct scheduling. Even so, these sites often require veterans uh, to follow up with phone calls. And if you miss the phone call, sometimes you miss an appointment. Um, does the bill require any additional language to apply to these types of scenarios and what type of oversight would be required to make sure the VA implements this bill if passed? Like I said, sometimes when you create the will, they find a way. Um, thank you for that. Um, I think that uh, the, I think maybe adding an additional, um, additional timeline for a follow up uh, to allow that room for those specific ones. Um, I know that uh, personally, getting community care for a GI appointment is impossible uh, to schedule the same day. Um, so I think that having that a timeline for the after you know, any follow-ups, and then keeping oversight of those tracking, um, that's where, you know, kind of the Transparency Act would come in. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, I yield back the remainder of my time.
Uh, Ranking Member Brownlee, um, do you wish to uh, make any closing remarks? Um, well, thank you for that. No, I, I don't really have any closing remarks, except I'm uh, excited about this hearing. I'm excited about the Elizabeth Dole bill, obviously, but there are many other good bills here. Um, so I, I, I thank the chairwoman for uh, making this uh, hearing happen so we can begin to move these bills along in the 118th Congress. So thank you. Uh, thank you. I look forward uh, to working through these issues and many more with the department, with my colleagues, and with my uh, the ranking member uh, and, and the, the members of this subcommittee. The complete written statements of today's witnesses will be entered into the hearing record. I also thank all of the witnesses for making the time and the effort to appear before us. I ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days to revise and extend their remarks and include extraneous material. Hearing no objections, so referred. I thank the members and the witnesses for their attendance and participation today. This hearing is now adjourned.